Um, hello and good evening to all our eminent speakers and participants in this webinar. Uh, my name is Peter. Um, I am the group uh, CEO of TMI. Um, as we all know, HR has changed and how. In the last 18 months, we have changed the way we work. Uh, not by choice, though. The change happened and we adapted as we had to sustain the businesses. Today, the minor adjustment has become the norm, as some are calling it the new normal. Recruitment, training, performance measurement, and every other aspect of people management is being redefined. Let's turn to the future. Big picture is now made up on small units. The micro is driving the macro. We are moving towards mass customization with focus on employee of one. We have with us leaders and thinkers who, with us who are managing the change and planning for the future role of HR in the context of micro HR. I now take pleasure to hand over to Mr. T. Murli Dharan, our group chairman, to lead the discussions with our eminent guests. Over to you, T. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, there are a lot of friends here today in this room, um, whom I consider as very personal friends. Uh, first of all, a very special welcome to Santhrip Ji, Rajesh, and uh, KK. All three of them are stalwarts in their own domain. And we are very keen to listen to you today. Like many of them, I'm also very keen to listen. We don't want to appear presumptuous as if we know what the future of HR should be. What we're going to share today is some of our thoughts and we are open for discussions with you and listen to your thought process. Before I start off the proceeding for today, I want to set up some broad um, announcements. The first one is of course the Sequence, I think the sequence is going to be, uh, Ravi will be presenting uh, briefly for 10 minutes about TMI 2.0 after I finish my context setting. And that will be followed by Santripji, Rajesh and uh, Krishna Kumar. Each speaker, I will introduce them uh, at first in the beginning. And especially I want to talk a little bit about the relationship with TMI. And each of them will speak for about 15 minutes and then we will have some questions in the end. Dr. Santrup is going to leave at six o'clock. So I'm going to try and see whether some questions for Dr. Santrup Ji, we can take it up after his talk is over so that we will have the freedom to leave. I've requested uh, Rajesh and uh, KK to stay back because the questions are very critical for many of the audience today. Uh, the post your questions on the, uh, I request all the audience to post their questions in the chat box, mention your name, uh, name of the person to whom you want to ask the question, and we will take it up in the end. We have two components of today's show. The first component is about launching TMI 2.0, which I've chief guest, Dr. Santip Mishra, has agreed to do so. We'll have a very, very, very short five second ceremony on this. Then there will be a talk by uh, our eminent speakers, um, including Ravi, will talk position TMI 2.0. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about TMI 1.0. Whenever we talk about 2.0, we need to talk about what is TMI 1.0. The story started sometime in 1991. And me and my partner, Mr. Thurab Lakadawala, who is from ex Rajasthan Lever, we are batchmates in IMA, and we started an agriculture business in Hyderabad between 1988 to 91, and we failed. And we decided to quit the business and go back to the corporate world. And we're having a cup of tea. And then we, uh, Lakadawala reminded me of my commitment to his father that I will not quit uh, for 1,000 days. There was a shortfall of about 30 to 40 days. And I said, we'll stay back. We'll not quit and keep our commitment. In that 40 days, a friend of my wife, who's currently an IS officer, came one day and he told me, why don't you raise an invoice for 50,000 rupees? I said, what is this 50,000 rupees? What is it for? He said, it's, a, it's called executive search. All you need to do is to make phone calls, connect people, and you make money. I was surprised because I didn't know what executive search was. And that was the first invoicing we did when TMI 1.0 started. Our first business was search in 1991. You've traveled a long distance from there, right? Uh, 
basically today, 30 years later, I'm going to just show you quickly where are we today in TMI uh, 1.0. Achana, can you just put the slide, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, and put it on display mode. So just quickly, uh, very quick background. We are three group companies. We operate in 16 countries now. Uh, our operations um, consist of 470 plus cities in India. And one of our proud customers, we are proud to participate in Birla Sun Life. 470 locations we hire for them, we train for them in, uh, for in, uh, many other companies and 400 plus locations. We have 780 partners, recruitment and training partners. And we work with uh, more than government and CSR customers, more than 51 of them. And we have about 65 100 plus e-learning hours we have clocked uh, on the, uh, both in 13 Indian and in seven international languages. The most interesting part of all of this, which I'm very proud of, is our work in the last one, what you see on the bottom, 1.3 million e-learners. Uh, Ravi has been working with the government of India to educate and train Anganwadi workers. About 1.3 million Anganwadi workers are now trained by TMI group company. And I'm very proud to say that more than 80% of them got certified and they're doing yeoman service and increasing, uh, improving the quality of health services at the village level. So this is where we are. So if you have to summarize uh, where we are today, we are in the top five in terms of third party phlegm or frontline executives and managers recruiting and induction. We are in the top five in India. Nationally, we're also top five in learning content and learning technology uh, with global footprints. I saw you, showed you some of the uh, countries where we are operating. We're also top five in India in the demand-driven scaling system. And I'm actually very proud of that because in NLDC ecosystem, we are one of the few partners who right from the beginning believed the government funding is not an option. We went for employer paid demand-driven scaling system. We have trained more than about 300,000 people and got them jobs across the country. So this is a very brief story of TMI 1.0. Now I'm going to talk about evolution. I think I'm a firm believer that we need to evolve. Everybody has to evolve. The species has to evolve. I personally moved from being an engineer, then I went to an MBA, and now I've just completed my law degree, but I hope to practice in the Supreme Court for five to seven years from now. Similarly, TMI group has evolved significantly from a single product company to multi-services group. TMI group is completely transforming itself now to 2.0. Ravi, a group CEO, will talk about and share some of the details shortly. So TMI from a multi-services company is now transforming into a performance, people performance consulting, measurement, modeling, predictive analytics uh, group. Second, we are becoming a tech company which HR automation, recruiting tech and learning tech under one roof. They have become a very, very uh, experienced now in analytics and tech-based micro-solutioning group. Uh, the solutions will be focused on how do you make employee of one. Why are we doing this? Why is TMI evolving? I think my fundamental belief, and that's the purpose of this seminar, I believe HR as a function also must evolve in the context of major events happening on work automation, uh, remote working, and most importantly, multiple employment relationship. We are no longer going to talk about full-time employees. We're going to talk about gig workers. We're going to talk about part-timers, people talking for sexy timers. Um, going 10 years, 15 years from now, a large number of our employees will be a combination of these. So the focus of HR will have to shift from aligning HR to business to aligning people to performance, to from performance analytics to predictive performance. I think this is a very important transition HR has to make from experience-based hypothesis to data-based hypothesis. You will see later on, Ravi will present some of the ideas. We were surprised that some of the data, which we analyzed data on people behavior, there were a lot of surprises in the way we, the uh, data was telling us a different story than what I thought from my experience. And fourth, from analyzing what we see to discovering what we don't see. Now, these are the, some of the transitions which I think HR has to make. We want to align to this new 
world of HR, and that's why TMI 2.0 is also evolving. So I seek your blessings and good wishes on this new journey of TMI. Now I'm going to introduce very briefly Dr. Santhik Mishra. Everybody knows him. I'll be surprised if many of us in this audience who have not heard of him or seen him in Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. He's a double postgraduate in is a double postgraduate, one in political science from Utkal University and personal management from TISS. He's also a double PhD uh, in public administration and industrial relationship, both in India and UK. He's also a lecturer and reader from TISS Mumbai. He made an extraordinary transition from academics to HR to business leader. 25 years plus in Aditya Birla Group after a short stint in HLL. Uh, elected as the top 25 role models in HR industry in 2019. You are the MD of your own performance and development. That's his famous quote. And I believe he's a perfect example of walking the talk. He has always scripted uh, his position and development in the organization. Santrupji, we are extremely, I'm extremely proud. On my first meeting, I, I don't know whether you remember, in 2000, when you were the HRD network um, president, and I was invited as a member. Your clarity of thought, your articulation, your ability to take people along, and your ability to remember people and their names has been remarkable. I became a fan of you instantly that day when I met you for the first time. Our relationship with the Rati Birla Group and Birla Sun Life has evolved from 2008 when we started. And today we are very, very strong um, relationship with Birla Sun Life. Inaugurate or launch 2.0. Yes, sir. I'm on. You can go and click on that, click to launch. Yeah. This is us, sir. All right. Thank you so much, Santruji. I, I think I'll remember this day for a very long time. I request Ravi now, our uh, group CEO, to quickly present in not more than 10 minutes. Uh, what is this TMI 2.2 all about? Over to you, Ravi. Hey, thank you, Murli. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, sir, we can. Yeah, Ravi, very briefly for the audience, Ravi is a um, BTEC from Benares and MBA from I'm Calcutta. But his very claim to fame is a science fiction fan and is also, in my opinion, one of the best learning science and learning technology expert in the country. He has been with TMI group for more than, I think, 20 plus, 25 years, Ravi? Yeah, 25 plus. 25 plus years. So you have 10 minutes, Ravi. And okay. I warn you two minutes in advance. So try and stick to the time. Thank sure. So thank you. So we've reinvented ourselves many times over the last 30 years. Uh, Murli was talking about the TMI 1.0. Well, it's been 1.0, it's been 1.1, 1.2, and so on. And we have invented ourselves many times over the last 30 years to stay relevant because of you, the customers who have been pushing us, which includes uh, the Birla Group, which includes Access. I think and Rajesh invited us in 2012. And then we've been proud partners of theirs. We are partners with Coca-Cola also, KK. And uh, so we have reinvented ourselves many times over. Uh, having said that, I think this is uh, the biggest reinvention that we are doing, where increasingly we are saying performance is the only language that clients speak. And interestingly, even individuals are speaking. And that's where, uh, based on some of our discoveries, we are thinking that TMI 2.0 has to be anchored around employee of one, whether we are in recruiting, training, learning, the entire life cycle of an employee with an organization into out. We have to start visualizing them as an employee of one. So what some of our discoveries is what I would like to talk about. Uh, I will skip that piece. So we got a lot of counterintuitive discoveries, which we believe, and in our opinion, at least that this is going to push for significant changes in how uh, human capital is managed. It could be in talent acquisition or development or management or even attrition management or any of these places. So I want to share four or five key ones that we have looked at. Like I said, 
number one that we are realizing now from our customers across the spectrum, whether it is IT companies, whether it is BFSI sector, whether it is FMCG, whether it's even overseas. Increasingly, we started working with Japanese companies to send people there. Everywhere, it's a performance matters and nothing else. So everybody, interestingly, is willing to consider different rewards and recognitions, different benefits model, uh, different job roles, uh, like Murli said, gig workers or job sharing, all sorts of combinations are coming out there thanks to COVID uh, impact and thanks to work from home and many more talent becoming available. On the other side, we did some surveys on the employee side. Uh, remuneration still matters the most, including whether they can make uh, the incentives and the performance praise and brand and job security. Of course, thanks to COVID, that's come up a little bit, job security, but otherwise brand and job security comes later. The interesting counterintuitive piece that we are seeing is the variations in performance will be huge. Uh, I'm on, this, on the second point, which I hope you can see. And the variations are really humongous, anywhere from nine times to 16 times uh, is the variation between a poor performer and a good performer. So how can any organization actually sustain this? This is actual data of feet of street in a BFSI sector customer of ours. Uh, uh, while normally one does four quadrants, we looked at uh, our own way of looking at it in six quadrants, though that's not the right word. The middle band is a 50 to 100% and the lower band is this. So if you, if you really see only 16% of them stayed on to actually deliver value to the account. That means they were 100% and beyond. And let's say we given them the honeymoon period of the first three months, beyond that, they are at 100%. And an incredible 45% dropped out of the way very early on. So there is going to be huge variations in performance of the incoming talent. And this needs to be managed. Interestingly, when we moved and looked at it even deeper, even post-training, the right-hand side is post-training what has been the performance of the same 585 people over a period of six months. And you'll see that many of them are in that band or the average performance is between 80% to 120%. That's the average performance. But underlining that is all these 580 guys have different charts below them. We looked at super performers, these 52. Even these 52 have incredible variation in their patterns and all these guys are above 140% of target month after month after month. And that's the sort of variation that managers will have to manage, HR and learning uh, teams will have to manage to see, can I reduce this variation? Why does the, if you look at this bus performer, he's gone up to almost 800, eight times the target for that month, nine times almost, right? And then he drops down to something like five times, then he drops down further, then he climbs up again. Even somebody out here, there is so much of variation. So this jaggedness in performance is something if we can manage, then performance outcome of the organizations is gonna be significantly higher. And this incre increasingly points towards looking at people as an individual. When we looked at attrition, this is for a different set of audience. When we looked at attrition, right, I'm on, uh, point number four, if you can see my screen, we're seeing that role induction training, when you do that really well and people get role clarity, it speeds up attrition, which is in, in our mind, good attrition. Otherwise, this guy stays on and then doesn't deliver value to the organization and eats up three months or four months or six months of salary. So if you can do good role induction and then the next stage is the performance pressure. So if you look at it, out of that entire attrition in a period of six, six months that we tracked, almost 96% is early attrition and 70% is there. So is there a good attrition? Can we define good attrition means if productivity does not go up within three months or within six months, depending on the complexity of the product? Should we let go of people? Uh, will HR be also responsible for you know, tactically letting go of people? And I think this was the most incredible discovery that we had when we worked with a bank. So the discussion was who's a good performer? 
who's a good who's a good supervisor and we looked at 10 different uh, aspects of that uh, you know what could be in the equation for defining a supervisor's sales performance and it was interesting that 44% of the standard deviation came down to the dispersion in the performance of the sales of his subordinates right so if he instead of he or she instead of having two or three people operating at three times the productivity norm and half a dozen people operating at 30 or 40% productivity, instead, if they can be between 60 or 70% to 120%, then you can predict the supervisor's sales very significantly. And also the scored attrition of the people who leave this person and go. So interesting modeling can be done out there in terms of who's a good performer and data allows us to do this. So the future we see for TMI, and we are hoping that increasingly organizations are discovering this too, that we will have to look at that micro HR. We'll have to, and I'll tell what we mean by micro HR, because if you really want macro performance, you're going to need micro HR. And we'll have to think of every employee as an employee of one, especially the large volume people who are in frontline sales uh, and the frontline sales managers, whom we have done an extensive amount of work recently. So what do we say? What do we mean by this? We think hiring will become micro. Increasingly, we are saying the same CV, when I show it in different geographies, with the same background, with the same work experience, even sometimes same demographic parameters, they're not getting accepted. Interestingly, even from one branch in Hyderabad to another branch in Hyderabad, the same CV does not get expect, accepted. We're seeing this because the customer types are different. So the branch head who wants to hire them is looking for a different profile. So my standard straw profile is going to keep on getting hyper local and will keep on getting evolved over time, perhaps over season. And sometime you might need a farmer. Sometimes you might need a hunter. So we Ravi, believe hiring will become micro. Maybe two minutes. Go yeah, to... I'm, I'm down to four, four slides only. Two minutes. Yeah. We think training will also be micro because based on the experience, demographic, psychographic, what is the past performance? What are the present competence? We'll have to give something that is interesting for this person. Similarly with learning and coaching and counseling, how can we have one coaching model that fits every employee of ours or every even frontline sales guy of ours? Why would they learn what they already know or something that they're good at? So we need to create, uh, you know, that again, treat them as employee of one and devise models for that. Even the progression path or how do we motivate them? How do we sustain them? How do we ensure that they don't quit and go? All of this, we'll have to think of them as individuals. How are we able to do it? We have recently invested over the last two years, a significant amount of effort in HR analytics, uh, both sides, tableau driven visualization and a lot of statistical analysis, uh, which gives us this descriptive, predictive, and interestingly prescriptive. Can we predict what's going to be the performance and more importantly, say who's the person who should hire, who's the person who can be retained. Data will tell us that if you can partner with customers and model this. So we want to actively partner with our clients to do this. Similarly, on the other side, we have invested over the last 14, 15 months in building HR bots, first for ourselves and now for our clients. We have a US customer now. So bots, because we believe increasingly HR can't be managed by just the recruiter or the payroll person or HR operations staff. You will need bots. The amount of transactions, the amount of data we will need to process is not going to be easy. So we've done some significant investment in HR bots building. And we think a combination of analytics and HR bots, along with this people consulting, where we hope to partner with external consultants, a lot of HR experts are out there. They are our friends. So we want to combine with them, use our analytics, use the bots and build models uh, using that performance analytics and re, uh, you know, remodel our entire delivery of hiring, learning, training, assessments, staffing, the entire uh, schema we are changing. Additionally, I'll just take a minute, Murli. We are working on a very interesting product on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we believe this Gen Z is not listening to old people. That's what we are hearing increasingly from many of our customers. They want to listen to each other. So we are creating a product initially for 
frontline executives and managers. It's, it's role centric. It's going to be peer assisted. So we are generating video. The model is to generate video content from performers. So if, for example, Rajesh in Access Bank, someone earns one lakh incentive, if you can ask him what are those three things that he is doing and take that combined with somebody else from some other location who's talking about maybe pitching somebody else about need, need identification. So we have rich video from peers, which will be believable, which will be easy for them to use. And we're building a simple model called ACT, Assess, Correct and Try. So we'll send them through assessments and then they learn good practices from each other, not from gurus whom they think gurus are too good. They can do it. We can't do it. But from peers, they will be willing to learn and improve themselves and they will try and test it. So that is, that is the avatar we see for ourselves consulting, for people performance consulting using analytics, bots. Uh, we will deliver it and then increasingly peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer activities. Thank you. To now invite Rajesh Dahiya to be the next speaker. Uh, Rajesh ji um, has spent uh, an early part of his life in Tata Group 20 years and Axis Bank 11 years. So he's a stayer. He's always been a stayer wherever he went. He had long stints and he always contributed very positively to these organizations. And people remember him whether in Tata Group or in Axis Bank. Very well connected with ground realities. He's been a very passionate player in Access Foundation. All of us know today is a very special day in Access Foundation. There's a day of reviews going on. And he's always been, uh, I've always been <clears throat> impressed and I've always been very happy talking to him about uh, ground realities, which uh, Santrupji, you talked about India being a nation of diversity. He's a keen observer of human behavior, believes in the power of humility, humor, and the ability to just be yourself. Uh, we work together. I, I happened to meet him in, accidentally in 2008 uh, in Tata's second career internship program. And there has been a beginning of a long, friendly, and a great admirational relationship between me and uh, Rajesh ji. He recently posted an SBR article titled, It's okay to be, it's okay to be not to be okay. And with his comment, I have carried this burden to be always okay for years. It's both emotionally draining and surprisingly physically tiring. And the best compliment or best comment he got was, thank you, Rajesh ji, for sharing your honest, your honesty is very refreshing. This is quintessential Rajesh ji, honesty, integrity. He loves to travel uh, by road. He loves poetry and he's also learning a lot of Indian languages. I know Rajesh ji, you're also making a new choices as you go forward in your life. So we are very, very grateful for you to find time to be here. And I want to thank you for being our friend. And over to you, sir. Uh, I will ping you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Murli ji. Yeah. Thank you so much. Before, before even uh, Dr. Mishra leaves, Santrup leaves, uh, I just want to say, uh, again, from my poetry learning, it was said of Ghalib that he did a great disservice to poetry, that after he wrote... His, his, in his times, there was nothing else left to write. So I hold Dr. Mishra as Ghalib of HR for myself. <laughs> I have I've seen him and people will be amazed uh, for the last 20 years. He would always be first in the queue where we'll be waiting at the backside and just to hear him. I would like to say all 200 participants that what you heard from Dr. Mishra uh, is his uh, opportunity for you to imbibe uh, as I'm doing it for, 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 for today and for the rest of my life. So we are lucky, uh, Dr. Mishra, I mean it from heart. And thank you very much for uh, being a guide, not only to the young people, but to many like us who have been in and out of HR for different reasons altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm also uh, privileged to be here. So uh, I was initially offended when uh, Murli called me a guest uh, then I realized maybe he doesn't want to give me dinner. So hence he's calling me a <laughs> special guest. Uh, uh, TMI Murli have been friends. Uh, my, one of the most passionate product called Skip, uh, I and Murli created. I remember Peter used to be with us. We spent endless nights uh, sitting in Bombay house uh, late at 11, 12 o'clock. We created uh, Tata people out of non-Tata uh, call center employees. So, so thank you very much. That journey continues. 
And from that, I will try to, uh, as I mentioned, I, I don't think there is much left to say after Dr. Mishra's talk, but let me build a different context and uh, let, let me speak from my heart and through some stories. So what's good today is we are speaking in the time we are speaking. Uh, this this uh, event could have very well have been two years earlier and we would have given a different kind of a message to people. And today, most of young people would have held us accountable that Murli or Dr. Mishra or uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar, you did not tell us how to deal with what we are going through. So thankfully, we are lucky that we will not be in hindsight questioned of, of not preparing the young generation for unknown times. Uh, jokingly, people say that one question that has gone out of HR vocabulary is, uh, what will you do after five years, which is good. Uh, that was a ridiculous question to begin with. And thankfully, it took a COVID to take such kind of uh, so-called cliched uh, beliefs that, that we, including myself, in HR have held for uh, so long. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on the whole concept of work, uh, work models, work frameworks, work approach, way, ways to work. And then comes the question that, that we're talking about is uh, work design and work measurement. Uh, you can call it performance measurement. Uh, but ultimately, I, I look at in context of uh, work because uh, there are other measurements which, which can have a different meaning altogether. So uh, let me break that into three broad parts. I was scribbling some notes as, as, as Dr. Mishra was talking. Uh, so one is I am very sensitive to the times that we are living in and how we as leaders at all levels are coping up uh, with uh, this learning of last two years. And, and as in this previously uh, Murli mentioned, we had our event in foundation. Uh, the question that I was thinking there is, uh, we are very happy that we are geared up for wave three. How many of us uh, go back to work and ask the question that are you prepared for wave 25th? Uh, if we don't ask that question, we will be in the same place as HR people as we were when there was no wave one. So my first uh, uh, question or, or a statement of challenge to all of us in any field uh, and uh, especially uh, people pe people who have to give solutions and give, give designs for us to be effective is be sensitive that we are living into fluid times. Uh, and there's only one way, and I, I draw analogies from nature, the way birds learn to fly on their own. I think that's, that's something that we need to imbibe uh, as HR professionals or any professional, uh, that we need to get more natural. As word is getting more fluid, more changing its course, we need to be agile. And... Uh, in, in my third chapter in my mind, maybe I'll bring agility and performance together. But my, my first reflection of the day is that are we comfortable with the unpredictability? Are we uncomfortable and saying that I know what's happening today, but I may not be fully prepared for tomorrow. But yes, as every second passes, as every moment goes, uh, as I come to work tomorrow morning, uh, I have wherewithal, I have the resources wherein I can learn and be with uh, the world that I'm living in. So, so that unpredictable world and agility of human being is paramount on my mind as I start looking at how, how people are going to be uh, uh, effective in future. I'm again repeating, uh, uh, as on today, uh, I, I, I can't think of any professional uh, who can say that I told you so this will happen. So there's a lot of learning for people like us uh, who now boast of 30 years and 35 years of experience and are used to saying, I knew it all and I told you so, that no, you did not know it all and you will never know it all and you, you will never be able to tell it all. So that, that's something which we should build into our beliefs. That is something we should build, build into what we build, are our processes, frameworks. Give it agility, which has uh, impermeable membranes which allows air to go in and out as human skin is. So that, that's my first, uh, in my mind, that's the first bucket I was thinking about that our biggest gift 
is that is is that thankfully we we are we 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 are today here surviving covid uh, all of us hopefully will survive whatever waves may come in but i just hope that learnings are not lost uh, as we move ahead of that uh the second aspect uh, which is coming to my mind with regard to performance uh, and again let me speak about individual performance collective performance because that's one point was given to me by uh, modli so uh, at as, as i'm looking at performance happening in virtual world or hybrid world i'm looking at two things at one end there's technology which is seeking and giving uh, efficiency which is giving uh, planning processes the team and and uh, uh, google meet and everything it has become so easy that we can just now break into four groups and do something and come back at the other end when you go to measurement and that's where i want to draw attention of uh, tmi team i'm sitting alone here it's my honesty it's my transparency of reporting it's my value system that you will depending on so never ever in the history of industrial world the two spaces of uh, so called systems and processes and i'm going pre tech areas of jack welch theories and human construct of character had to come together and at the intersection of these two lie the solution to what we are sending out to do that is where the performance is happening where at one end there is hard hardwired hardware uh technology systems planning efficiency uh, measurements at the other end ultimately it's a in the hand of one employee whose 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 trust or whose reporting you will have to accept for team's performance so uh for me performance in 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 in, in so called organized world and creativity in in a different world where i belong to uh, are at the intersection of the values and the work that happens that leads me to my uh, third point uh, which which again is almost like a, 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 a gift with which i personally got from uh, the covid times uh, at axis we 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 are and dr mishra allowed that that we can promote our brand for me there's only one brand axis uh, so we are creating a, what we call as a super app where we are helping our frontline people get nudges get leads uh, get, uh, get get information about customers the moment they walk in so the the focus is shifting from measuring performance to making performance happen so as supervisor as manager my job is not merely to measure performance but my job is to making performance happen and that's where i think your 2.0 uh will be greatly uh useful for people second thing which which uh, this does is make what does making performance happen do to managers so the key question there is that managers will now have to play roles of mentors and coaches uh, they, they will be human nudgers nudger, who will help their teams to move in the right direction and that in the end brings me to what i mentioned as uh, the biggest uh, good outcome for me uh, 20 25 years back i remember in one of a, a conference i i in my youthful anger made a statement in uh, a, a seminar saying that every time somebody uses the word leader i i feel like as a junior manager i feel like that nobody cares for me because leader is that ceo and a cxo who's sitting on the panel uh every time somebody talks of coaching they talk about coaching of ceo cxo i remember i was a senior manager uh distribution selling pesticides in india at that point in time this covid has democratized leadership these times have democratized the definition of coaching and mentoring and for me in my bank my biggest coaches and mentors are today sitting in my branches not in my central office my coach is not somebody who's coming from usa or uk or europe or india with iic a degree my best coaches are people who got set of people who who can tomorrow proclaim best performance from their teams so so these are the three buckets broadly which i thought i'll i'll uh, put my thoughts around uh, some of it is uh, aligned to i think 
uh, Murli ji, what you mentioned in 2.0, some of it may not be. Last point in summary, uh, uh, there was a mention by Ravi about salary. I agree. Uh, you can't do much about it. You can uh, be only spiritual and philosophical, but yes, yeah, salary is salary. The brand that you mentioned, the definitions of brands are going to change. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar, with his experience in Coke, can teach us many things. How a, a, a giant like Coke can make a shift from where they were in terms of their reputation to today a sustainable company. And the leadership Coke has taken in, in, in becoming a sustainable company across the world by taking bold steps. So the word and brand are going to be defined by what do you do to the planet, how sustainable you are, and that's where you will be able to attract people. So I just wanted to make that one point around that definitions of uh, compensation may remain same, but definition of brands will change. Brands will be who are accountable to society or to larger stakeholders. I think uh, DJSI, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley Index, they will have to redefine their parameters because as I see today, uh, they measure uh, ESG on social on employee on things like child labor, ergonomics. I think they have to move ahead in their journey and redefine what does it mean to be an employee in today's time whom their superiors expect to be uh, so-called performing employees. So these are my thoughts. Happy to take any questions. Rajesh ji, this question is about routine jobs. I, uh, the question is, as routine jobs are getting automated, workforce is expected to become more experts. Now, if, if there's such a large productivity variation exists, even among experts, what measures should HR take? The assumption normally we make is that people are not trained, we can train them better. But even experts, if there's a wide variation, what can HR do? That's the question which has come. Over to you, Rajesh ji. So again, these are, uh, I, I'll admit these are not easy questions, but let me take a real life example of uh, uh, audit. Uh, and I'm, I'm taking a financial services example where uh, you'll know the importance of audit. We will have in a bank of our size, we'll have 600 people. Uh, and these are senior people, uh, responsible people. And yes, lots of what auditors used to do usually is getting automated because uh, data is centralized. There are now AI ML tools which can go through multiple records and through abrasion, through abrasions or variances very easily. So at one end, the question may be that there is no need for anyone to go to a branch and look, go through vouchers and papers. It's easily available, uh, a click of a button. It's either there or it can be extracted in a millisecond uh, of what, what, what usually would take. Uh, but when I look back, and, and as we started our journey of automation and uh, audit in access, we realized that it is not about doing away with uh, repetitive jobs. It's about enlarging the intelligence that, that lies in that data. So uh, manually going to a branch, looking at a voucher and finding a variation because the uh, connecting entry is not there uh, would take lots of time. But suddenly the same things are getting built into our early warning signals. These data points are getting consolidated and our auditors are becoming data scientists who put all these patterns in front of them and are able to predict the risk uh, rating of every branch to a very granular level on a daily basis. So uh, uh, I am I'm a strong votary of not jumping or throwing. This can be automated. So let's get the people out and put a machine here. And this same conversation we had 25 years back when, when uh, robots came into our factories. I remember in uh, chemical factories, we had automation of a different nature altogether. So there is still a opportunity to enhance quality of work uh, by doing more and more, do away with repetitive clerical work, create opportunities for uh, value adding propositions, uh, is, is my message. I can take example in any field, you know, you do recruitment and the way you have done that through automation uh, in terms of efficacy of people joining, efficacy of their productivity is a real example. You're not thrown people out. You have put different people to different use. So, so uh, I think we got miles to go before we say that yes, machines can replace human beings and then 
we need to face the challenge. Rajesh ji, this question is about people. Uh, one of the bigger challenges we find about people is that people don't like to be measured. And as we go into the world of more and more micro measurement, more and more detailing measurement, there is going to be a lot of resentment and people don't like to be called out. There's a measurement on the output side, measurement on the input side. How do we manage this? I think this is one of the questions uh, in the context of larger quantum of measurement and micro measurement. Over to you, Rajesh. So, Murli ji, I think Dr. Mishra alluded to that. Uh, it's it's uh, the whole notion that people don't want to get measured hinges on how does one measure them. Uh, none of us want somebody to be watching a, a, a camera standing on our head and 24 hours we being watched for each activity. Uh, that is, that's, a, that, that's true. Uh, secondly, not the system's not being sensitive. And you mentioned that what happens in a branch does not happen in another branch. Uh, uh, what's, what's true for one geography may not be true. So having uh, multiple uh, uh, challenges is reality for people. Uh, I, I, I Again, going back to the same point, uh, today, uh, sadly, uh, one, one area where I think we have misused technology is our performance management systems. These have become so mechanical. There are 20 KRAs and every morning, the moment I log in, first thing is uh, flash my performance in front of me saying that I am three meters behind my line and all that. And, and there is no human interface. There is not even a discussion. Uh, so either either we need to move to more evolved technologies where there is a, a, a parallel system which is also explaining rational and then converting that into how to do performance, as I mentioned earlier. Or, or maybe, uh, uh, as you mentioned earlier, if, if more and more is getting uh, uh, automated, uh, the, the people who are getting free, they should be mentors. They should be performance coaches. Uh, HR should reinvent uh, another vertical. I don't know. They don't. We have a PMS department which is only four or five people uh, in a large company. Also, take the largest company and ask how many people they have in a performance management department. Not not more than four, and they will have forty people in recruitment. Change this paradigm because your existing people are more than what you are going to hire. The performance of your existing people is more important than what you are going to do with new hires. But still, HR department will put all their energy into hiring and not into performance management. So I will, I will strongly vote for saying uh, have performance coaches uh, who will be there on the screen when, when I'm looking at my performance every day. One of the question to you is knowing multiple Indian languages, how are they beneficial to HR people? In what way has it helped you and how can it help? So again, uh, 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 I, 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 I will be foolish if I say that it will help me understand uh, people in, I'm, I'm learning Canada. So, so idea is not to go to Bangalore branch and start interacting with it's, it's a learning language is a mental process. It's not a, uh, a language alone. Uh, somebody has told me it's been proven riding a bike, doing maths, basic primary maths question and learning, a, a learning a language makes your mind agile. Mm. So this is a self-training program to stay agile. Uh, for me, it's it's not to do with what I'll do with that language. It's it's it's, it's something which which is a almost like a crossword that you may prefer. Uh, I, I I prefer a language root to keep my mind fresh and agile. Uh, 